So what I'll do is I'll post that revised schedule out there this afternoon for you to make sure that everybody's got access to that. But what we're going to do today is we're going to cover chapter six and seven, and it is strictly just informational. You're not going to have an exam on it. And I want to do this because you should have had this, the, the LSC students and the management students should have had this in the 343 already. And then in particular, those of you that are taking some of Dr. Norse classes, you're going to have had the inventory part of it in there as well. And so I don't want to do a lot of overkill, but I want to frame it up in terms of this particular course. Okay. So again, it's just informational only today. Um, and just to kind of hit on a couple of the highlights that I want to make sure that you're, uh, that you're taking these uh, things away from uh, the LSC classes. So let's go ahead and... All right. So chapter six is about um, managing the supply chain and inventory analysis. Okay. Um, and so, you know, what, what we're talking about with managing the supply chain is you're trying to match that demand with your supply. And so in context of this course, we're trying to manage that materials waiting time because um, one of the key takeaways for you should be if I have more inventory, it just takes things longer to flow through the system, right? That's Little's Law um, has pretty well shown that to us, okay? Um, and then, but inventory is, my take on it is inventory is not bad or good, it's a tool, right? And you have to decide how best to use it. So uh, you're going to find people that take the approach that, well, you should have no inventory and little or no inventory. Um, and I probably shared the story of when I came, one of the reasons I got the job at, at Pella uh, here was because the supply chain manager before me was very focused on his inventory terms number. And he was shutting the plant down regularly because they were running out of material, right? And so here's the plant working overtime, and then they have to stop because they run out of material. And um, so you have to be smart enough to treat it like it's your own business and what's the right business decision. So in the short term, maybe he looked like a hero because he had these great inventory terms numbers, but in the long run, he ended up not keeping his job because, I mean, part of that is balancing inventory terms with making sure that your folks are able to produce. And that directly tied into the on-time delivery performance. Like when I got to Murray, so Murray was a relatively new plant. It was probably two to three years old when I got there. And their on-time delivery performance was not good. And you kind of expect that when a facility starts out. They're working out the kinks and they're getting things figured out. But after you've been there for a while, you should be, instead of jumping through hoops to make things happen, you should be setting process and letting the process work. And so there's this transition from, okay, we're heroes. And, and this is in the scheduling team that I had in Story City, it was the same thing. They were heroes when they made things happen and got material in, right? And so the previous manager there, that was his perspective because he was there when they started the plant. So let's say that the plant ran out of parts and Troy, you're a scheduler and you made it happen, you got, you got it in and John would go to them and go, good job, Troy, way to make it happen, right? And so then John goes on to corporate Pella and I come in and my question is, great, I'm glad we got that taken care of, but why did it happen? And what do we need to do next time to make sure that it doesn't? What's wrong with our process that we didn't, that, that that happened, right? And so you've got to make that transition from thinking about, okay, well, we're just going to do whatever we have to do to make it happen. Yeah, you want to do that. So what's wrong with our system if we're not able to make that happen? And so then, um, and it was such that the plant manager even made a bet to try to, with the teams to try to encourage them, you know, um, to uh, get their on-time delivery performance up, that if we went for a month with no late deliveries, right, he would shave his head, right? So between shifts after, I think it was probably the third month I was there, we were able to sit him down between shifts, and then somebody who was a former barber uh, that worked in the production line came up and shaved his head in front of all that. So it was some kind of a fun, crazy kind of thing to do. And then we went from there, and, and our on-time delivery was excellent from that point forward. So this... But it's not that you don't want to have any inventory. You want to make a conscious decision about what what kind of inventory do you want to carry. So chapter six is just kind of to talk about the different types of reordering systems and to hit these levers for improvement that we've got um, to manage our inventory. Okay. So <clears throat> a couple of, of things. These are dated 2008 logistics costs in the U.S. economy. Freight transportation was 864 billion. 
Inventory expense was $420 billion. Administrative expense was $60 billion. And so logistics-related activity was almost 10% of GDP. Okay. Um, and so our inventory, right, is working capital. And so reducing our inventories reply, implies less that we're going to have less working capital. And so we ask, well, why do our inventories arise? Because we have a mismatch between our demand and our supply. Okay. So there are some costs associated with matching supply and demand, right? We have the cost of overstocking. Okay. First off, I have to hold it. So I, while I'm holding it, I'm paying basically interest expense to hold that. I'm taking up physical space in my facilities. And I have this obsolescence issue, right? So at some point, I'm maybe going to change out or the market's going to change and I'm going to have all this inventory and it's not going to be valued the same as what it is when it's turning quickly, okay? And then there's the cost of understocking, which says I'm going to lose sales, right? If I don't have the product that my customer wants, then I'm not going to, um, then I'm going to lose the margin on potentially uh, that particular sale. Okay, so these should be familiar, right? So our, um, what we've got going on between the buffer and the operation, right, we're just waiting. All, all our inventory is doing in the buffer is waiting, okay? So we want to try to um, reduce that buffer, right, and just have it focus in on the operational part of it. And so kind of tying back into the last chapter, we're going to talk about flow time efficiency here. So if you think about flow times in these white collar processes, the examples that they're giving us, in life insurance, a new policy application, the average flow time is 72 hours, right? And the theoretical flow time, the time that it actually takes them to do what they need to do with it, is seven minutes, right? It's a 0.16%, less than 1% flow time efficiency, right? Consumer packaging, right, if they're going to do some new graphic design, the average flow time is 18 days. The actual theoretical flow time is two hours, again, less than 1%. And so you're kind of seeing that as you go through those processes. There's a lot of things that happen where things are just kind of hanging out and waiting for somebody to get to them, okay? And so, um, <clears throat> again, what this class has been about is how do we get rid of that waiting time? How do we get rid of those non-value adding activities, okay? Um, and so, again, these are symbols that are familiar to you, right? Flow time is equal to inventory divided by throughput, and so therefore what we know is the more inventory we have, the longer our flow time is, okay? All right, so why do buffers build or why do we hold inventory? Well, we have different reasons for it. Um, uh, you can call it cycle or batch stock, right? That's the, the inventory that you're actually using in your operation. Um, so you might do it for economies of scale because you have fixed costs associated with batches, right? So maybe you set up and run larger batches so that you don't have to have, you're not wasting those setup times, right? Um, maybe you're getting quantity discounts, right? And that's something that we should have dealt with in some of our other classes in terms of how to look at whether or not that's a profitable um, option for us. Or maybe we have some trade promotions and we need to set up and make sure we're going to have some on hand for that, okay? The other, one of the other reasons that we do it is because we have uncertainty in the marketplace. And that's usually kind of the big driver of it, right? So we hold what we call safety stock in order to compensate for uncertainty. And uncertainty can come from places like maybe I don't know what my customers are going to do, right? So I have an uncertain demand, okay? Maybe I don't know what my um, production line is going to be able to do. Maybe they're very variable, okay? So maybe I have to hold some safety stock to cover that. Or maybe my vendors don't deliver regularly, so I have to hold some safety stock to compensate for that. And you have this kind of variety of reasons, but the thing that we do is we hold safety stock in order to, to compensate for that uncertainty in the system, okay? Um, we also have seasonal variability. I mean, you think about, you know, the, to me, the easy example there is Christmas time, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense to produce things in February for December, right? But you can't produce everything that's going to be demanded in December in December, right? That's typically, that's a challenge for us. So that's a, just a, the simplest example of seasonal, okay? Um, and then you can have strategic stock. And I haven't spent a lot of time on that one. You know, they're talking about availability, you know, I assume um, strategic could be if you're thinking about something that you want to do in the marketplace, right? Um, but again, I haven't spent a lot of time with that one. 
So we have different costs of inventory. Um, and this, again, should be a refresher back to 343 and back to one of Dr. Norris classes. Um, we've got the cost of inventory. We've got the <coughs> physical holding cost, means I've paid for it, now I've got to hang on to it. The financial holding cost, well, because I've paid for that, I have this opportunity cost, I can't do something else because I've already spent that money over here. Okay? Um, and they talk about this low responsiveness in terms of the demand in, and market changes. If I have a bunch of inventory, I'm committed to this path, right? And so the longer I can hold off on that commitment to a particular path, the better off I'm going to be. And then to supplier quality changes, right? Nothing is worse than deciding that in, for, let me give you the hello window example, to decide in May that you're going to make a change um, to your product because May is when we typically have the peak amount of inventory in the system. So that change actually doesn't go into effect then until we roll through all of the inventory we have in the system. And then it's always a challenge because you don't want to be rolling out some windows like you want a cutoff date, right? From this point forward, everything we sell is going to be like this. And those are hard to manage if you have a lot of inventory, okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> um, I pulled some slides from our 343 text so just because I think it does a pretty good job of talking about some of these different models, right? Um, and so one of the things I want you to come away from the, these LSC classes is to make sure that you understand there's kind of three basic models, okay? Um, we have the single period model, we have a fixed order quantity, and a fixed time period. The single period model is oftentimes called the news vendor problem, okay? And so it's called that because it's like a newspaper. So how many newspapers are you going to produce for tomorrow's sales, right? And whatever you produce, if you underproduce, you're going to miss out on profit. And if you overproduce, they have little or no value the next day, right? So newspapers, Halloween costumes, things that are going to go bad, like fresh fruits and vegetables, that kind of a thing. So how do you decide how much you're going to order because they have this shelf life associated with them, okay? So that's, that's that single period news vendor problem. The next kind is what we call fixed order quantity. So that's the second model that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> and the fixed order quantity model just says, I watch my inventory, and when I hit a certain point in my inventory, that triggers me to reorder. Okay? And then the third one we talk about is a fixed time period model. And the example that I use of that is the Pella milk runs that we used to do, right? We have a truck that would go up to Minneapolis every week, and it would pick up on Tuesdays. It would run a route around Minneapolis and pick up all the orders that we had up there. So what we would do is every Friday, we would order what we needed to pick up on the following Tuesday. So that's a fixed time period. Every Friday, I'm going to look because my truck's going to be up there on a particular day, right? So you've got kind of those three basic ways to look at how are we going to order, okay? And so, again, we'll hit that... <clears throat> The single period model, used when you're making a one-time purchase of an item. The fixed order quantity, used when you want to maintain an item in stock and when we restock a certain number of units need to be ordered. And a fixed time period is the item is ordered at certain intervals of time. Okay. <coughs> Again, I think this slide just covers that same, those, that same information, just in a slightly different way. Okay. But I thought this slide does a good... good uh, job of covering the different costs that are associated that we have to try to balance. The holding costs, right, for storage, handling, insurance, etc. The setup costs, and those setup costs can be um, if I'm producing it, if I change over the equipment, maybe it takes me two hours, six hours, ten hours, 36 hours, whatever that is, there's a cost associated with transitioning from one type of production to another, okay? And that's going to affect then the size of the batches that you're going to run. Okay. Ordering costs. So if I'm purchasing it, whoever my scheduler is, every time they place an order, they have to go through a certain amount of work to get the order placed. There's a certain amount of cost associated with the receiving. Okay, so there's there's again the ordering costs that, that are associated with it. And then on the flip side of that, if I don't have the amount of inventory, then I've got those shortage costs. <clears throat> All right. And the fixed order quantity model, right? Demand for the product is, so these are the assumptions, right? And they're the core assumptions when we do our basic economic order quantity, which the EOQ, which most of you should have heard of, right? And so the, the base assumptions when you start out with the most pure form are demand for the product is constant and uniform throughout the time period. Lead time is constant, 
right? Price per unit is constant. Inventory holding cost is based on an average of the inventory. Ordering or setup costs are constant, and all demands for the product will be satisfied, okay? So it's like that perfect world, okay? So in chapter six in this book, and in most books, they start out talking about the perfect world. And then we say, well, what do we do to compensate? Because we don't live in the perfect world. Well, what we do is we use safety stock, and that's what chapter seven is about. Okay? So again, in that perfect world, those are the types of assumptions that we take. And so if those are the assumptions, then we get what we call the sawtooth diagram. Okay? And the sawtooth diagram basically says almost every intro uh, ops class draws this. Right? We have time here and we have quantity here. And in the perfect world, I'm at zero. I get in the amount that I'm going to order and I use it at this regular rate. See how perfect that usage line is? And then when I hit zero, right? Then, don't you know, that's when my next order comes in, exactly when I hit zero, right? So again, it's this perfect world. Then I'm going to use exactly at the same rate, and when I hit zero, that's going to come in, okay? And so there's some things that, based off of that perfect <coughs> world, that we can make assumptions about. And some of the assumptions that we're going to make are, if I order 100 units and I use at an exactly even rate, right, my average inventory is going to be that 100 units divided by 2. It's going to be half of what I order. Okay? So that's where you can come up with that Q divided by 2 is typically your average inventory amount. Okay? And that's in the perfect world with no safety stock. Right? Um, some other things that we can say is, well, I can determine how many times a year I'm going to have to order. Right? And that's easy enough. If I order, um, let me think about this for a second. If my total demand is 12,000 units and I order 1,000 each time, how many times a year am I going to order? Well, right? It's pretty easy, right? And all that, that's all they're saying with this R divided by Q. I can determine how many times a year I'm going to order, okay? <laughs> and so because we've got kind of these perfect world, we can get those assumptions. We know what our average inventory is. We know basically how many times a year we're going to have to order, okay? <clears throat> and so then we can go on to say, well, I want to find the, the best amount of inventory for me to order. And so one way to go about that is to just start running this series of, well, what if I ordered 50 to what if I ordered 1,000? What would my total cost be, right? Because I can say, okay, well, if I ordered 50, here's how many times a year I'd have to order. So I can calculate my annual setup cost. I take how many ever times a year I have to order times what my setup cost is. And I can get my annual holding cost because I know my average inventory, right? I'm going to take Q divided by 2, and I'm going to take it times my holding costs and my inventory carrying costs, right? So what happens is, we have our annual setup costs and our annual holding costs, and we would flow down this diagram and try to find where do we have the lowest total amount. Well, it looks to me like it's at 520, right? And what you find is that lowest total cost is at the point where setup costs and holding costs are equal to each other, okay? So if that's the case, then I no longer have to go through this exercise I can set a formula where setup costs and holding costs are equal to each other, which is our economic order quantity. And when I set those equal to each other and solve for Q, right, then I get it's the square root of two times the cost per order times the <coughs> annual demand divided by my holding costs. Okay? So again, that's a refresher because you, you've had that in your 343. Um, and so that's, that's all we're doing when we get to the EOQ is we're trying to find, well, what's the, in the perfect world, what's the amount of inventory that we would need to hold in order to have the lowest total cost? <coughs> okay, so some things that we want to make sure that we understand. Increasing batch sizes of Q of the order increases our average inventory, right? So if I've had 100, my average inventory, 100 divided by 2 is 50. If I increase it by another 100 units, it's going to increase my average inventory. Okay. The optimal batch size minimizes those supply chain costs by trading off your setup costs and your holding costs. You've got that, you're, you're making that trade-off decision. So to reduce your batch size, what you have to do is you have to reduce your setup time, right? So you have to reduce that cost between um, producing one type to another, okay? So economies of scale are manifested by the square root relationship between the EOQ and our total demand and our setup costs. Okay, in that formula. So if demand increases by a factor of four, it is optimal to increase batch size by a factor of two. Okay, and again, this is just informational. It's just trying to make sure that you've got understand that there's that relational 
um, between how much you order and um, how much inventory you're carrying. Okay. Um, so again, just another quick look at the, the sawtooth diagram and what you're trying to decide is how much to order and when to order it, right? So if I asked you <clears throat> if your demand per day were 10 units, right, and your lead time was two days, at what point would you reorder? What quantity amount would you need to reorder? I've seen lots of yawns. <laughs> so if your demand per day were 10 units per day and your lead time were two days, when do you need to reorder? How many units left on hand do you need to reorder in the perfect world? 20, right? Because all you're doing is saying, I've got two days until I need to have my, my uh, stock in, so if I use 10 units a day, then my reorder point is going to be 20. So it's just how, what's your demand per day times how many, how many days of lead time. Okay, so that's how you get to your reorder point. But if the lead time is greater than the time between orders, then there's going to be more than one outstand more than one order outstanding. So then you have to adjust your inventory position. Not a big deal. You guys, when you're in the working world, you'll you'll automatically do that. Okay. But what we need to do is think about how we're going to establish safety stock levels. Okay, and this starts to kind of tie into Chapter Seven. I pulled this in from the uh, previous text. But safety stock can be determined based on a number of different criteria, okay? Sometimes you want to just make a certain number of weeks of supply, so then you have, that's how you determine what your safety stock is. A better approach is to assume that demand is normally distributed and assume that we know the mean and standard deviation of that demand, and then we decide our uh, customer service level and go from there, okay? The reason that we need to use safety stock, right, is because, you see, we now are making adjustments to those assumptions. Before, our usage rate was just that perfect line, right? And we got right to zero and got it in. But the reality of it is, it's not that perfect line. We have that variability in it, and so we have to account for the variability, and that's what the safety stock does for us. It gives us that cushion so that when we get, to, when we would normally get to zero in the perfect world, if we've got variability where we're using more, we have some cushion where we can um, apply that safety stock to. So demand is variable but follows a known distribution. After the reorder is placed, demand during the lead time may be higher than expected, assuming some or all of the safety stock. Okay. So in that case, our um, reorder point is now revised. It's not the 2 times 10 anymore. It's the 2 times 10 plus whatever our safety stock number is. Right? And chapter 7 is what we're going to, where we look at that safety stock um, portion of the formula. So again, here's your basic reorder point, average demand times lead time. Here's your safety stock piece of that, okay? <coughs> so again, we have some different policies that we might use. In a continuous review, we monitor the inventory all the time. In a periodic review, we occasionally go out and look at the inventory and, and then make our decisions based on that periodic review, okay? I think we've been there already. Okay, here's just a comparison of the kind of two. So remember we talked about there were three, right? The single period or news vendor, which is really kind of this unique case. So we're going to leave it off over into the left over here, and we're going to just compare a fixed order quantity versus fixed time period. So in a fixed order quantity, inventory remaining must be continually monitored. It has a smaller average inventory because you're only looking at it or you're looking at it constantly and you don't have to wait for a specific time period to trigger, right? You're just constantly looking at it. Um, it favors more expensive <coughs> items. It's more appropriate for important items, okay, because it's also more costly. If you're going to be watching something in the system, doing the transactions all the time, all of that adds a little bit of cost to it. Requires more time to maintain, but is usually more automated and is more expensive to implement. Fixed time period. Counting takes place only at the end of the review period. So whatever time frame that is, if it's every Friday, you go out and count what you've got and make your order. It has a larger average inventory, okay? Favors less expensive items, is sufficient for less important items, requires less time to maintain, and is less expensive to implement, okay? <coughs> the fixed time period part of it, um, think about screws, nuts, and bolts, right? Are you really concerned if you're 100 less or more on screws, nuts, and bolts? It doesn't matter, 
right? So, so that's the kind of thing it's easier to carry more of and not count it as often than it is to try to count it every day or try to count every screw nut and bolt that you're going to use, right? And there's a system cost to it. I think it's interesting when, when I left Pella, um, so that would have been in like 2007 maybe, 2006 or 2007, they had this real push to get everything on the inventory system, like everything. They wanted all the bills of material 100% accurate. And then um, when I went back to touch bases with them later on, the conversation had changed. And it had changed because trying to get every part on the system had clogged their system down so much that when they try to run the MRP at, the, at, at night, it would actually slow down the production floor because it slowed the printers down because they had so much chugging through the system to try to calculate what parts they were going to need to order. So again, there are these kind of trade-offs. You have to decide what's important, what's what's not. Screws, nuts, and bolts, not a big deal, right? And so you kind of have to, um, you know, pick your, uh, I don't want to say pick your poison, but pick your pick your battles, right? What's, what's really important, okay? So also in terms of um, that comparison, <clears throat> your order quantity, um, you're ordering the same amount every time in a fixed order quantity model, and in the, in the fixed time period, it's variable. Okay, it depends on what you have in inventory, how much you're going to order. Um, you decide when to reorder in the uh, fixed order quantity model when you hit that reorder point, and in the fixed time period, it's when you get to that particular time period. Um, we've talked about the record keeping already, and again, the size of inventory, it's smaller in the Q model than it is in the P model, so Q model is fixed order quantity. Um, and it takes more maintenance and the fixed order quantity, and you want to use higher priced or more critical items. Okay? <clears throat> okay, I think we've kind of hit that last slide. So in terms of levers for managing inventory, so if you're somebody that has a, a project where you're working with inventory, right, things that you want to do is you want to think about how can I reduce the process flow rate, because that's going to reduce the amount of inventory that you have in the system. How can I reduce the batch size? Okay, because that's again going to shorten the amount of time that it's in the system. Um, one of the options that you can use is use price and incentive tactics to promote stable demand patterns. So, for example, um, you know the I can't remember it's uh, it wasn't Huggies, it was one of the major diaper manufacturers, and they were having trouble Pampers, I think, and they were having trouble because they were doing um, these. Sales <coughs> diapers. Have I told you this story in here before? Okay. So what happens is they wouldn't have they wouldn't have much demand, and so they use price, right? And they'd lower the price, and the diapers would go on sale, and then they'd sell a bunch of diapers, and then they would fill their pipeline up. And this is the example of the bullwhip effect. So they pull their, you know, they build, they have a bunch of diapers, and then the next thing you know, they weren't selling anything because the sale would go away, right? And so then they'd be like, okay, well, we have to drop the price. So they drop the price, and they sell a bunch of diapers. Can you tell me, do you think that babies use more diapers in that cycle? It has completely to do with buying behavior. It doesn't have anything to do with how many diapers babies are using, right? Those of us that have had kids, you buy diapers when they're on sale, right? And so what they found is it was better to just lower the price and keep a low price overall instead of trying to do this because they were having all these problems. So that's an example of when using price can actually backfire on you. When you may want to use price, um, so let's say you're a window manufacturer. Well, maybe you want lower prices early in the spring or in the wintertime to try to keep that demand, to try to keep people interested in buying Okay. And you're trying to find ways to reduce uncertainty in your supply and demand. Can you link up with your retailers right, and get direct access to what they're selling? Um, the guy that wrote the goal, um, Eli Goldratt, he has a really interesting YouTube video if you ever just want to, want to go out and look. And he's talking about the computer um, manufacturers back in the day, and they were you know, going through a recession period. And they were wanting to, he was, he was consulting with a particular company about they were wanting to lay off a bunch of people because that's what other people in the computer industry were doing. And he's like, after he looked at what they were doing and he looked at the entire marketplace, what he found is they had had so many computers in the supply chain that what was happening is they were just cleaning out the supply chain as opposed to they weren't actually, um, and if you looked at the 
final demand of the customer, while it had dropped some, it had not dropped to the degree to justify laying off all these people because he could see if this is where we're at, soon we're going to have all the computers sold out of our, our um, uh, safety stock across the industry, and all these other people have laid off. If you don't lay off, you're going to be in a position to take advantage of that, right? And that's actually the way it works. But you have to be smart enough to look down the road, right? You can't look at just what's happening, what's happening in front of me, but what's going to happen down the road. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, I've been in a couple situations at Pella where, like, huge orders would come in and people would, like, start to panic. Okay? Or on the opposite side, like, no orders would come in and people would start to panic. The huge orders were um, a salesperson made a mistake and added a zero to the, what he was doing. And so, you know, we were gearing up for overtime to try to meet this demand because we have a seven-day window to get those Pardon that. There's no pun intended. Seven-day window to get the windows to Lowe's, right? And on the flip side of that, um, it was like January, and sales dropped off to nothing. And we were like, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to go down to 32 hours a week. We're going to have to get people out of here, you know? Well, no, they were just getting ready to do inventory at Lowe's, and so they didn't want any units. They weren't ordering any units in. It's not that the end demand had changed at all. It's just what the, their ordering behavior had changed. So you have to make sure that you're making that distinction between what's happening with the customer, what are they actually doing, and what's happening with those intermediaries, right? And so try to make sure that you're paying attention to that. Okay. Let's go to Chapter 7 then. Okay, so chapter seven, I think, is again, we're going to build off of chapter six, but we're going to talk about, they talk about managing what they call flow variability or your safety inventory. <coughs> um, so they have a couple of, of examples um, that, that they brought up. The Apple iPhone broke sales records when it sold 1.7 million units on release day, yet people were lining up to buy the gadget a week later. It's estimated that Apple could have sold an additional two to half, two to two and a half million if they'd had the product available. And that was in 2011. Uh, during 2007, Nintendo's game system Wii was hard to get due to supply shortages. Analysts estimate that the company was leaving close to 1.3 billion on the table in unmet demand. Right? Mumbai's real estate is said to be a hot property. However, in the last quarter, sales have dipped so low that builders are getting worried. At the current pace of consumption, it will take two years and four months to exhaust the stock in the system. And that's alarming because a healthy market is supposed to have only about eight months in inventory in it. Okay? Uh, an inventory write-off widened fourth quarter losses at Bluefly. So despite a substantial increase in revenues at the online fashion retailer, fourth quarter revenues were up 10% to $29.7 million but the inventory write-off knocked back to gross profit by an additional 7%, so that they, um, while the company's net loss for the quarter widened to 5.6 million from 3.5 million from the previous year, right? And so you can imagine in the fashion industry, if you have the wrong product, you're, you're in, you know, and so that's, your choices are to sell it for less, or maybe even to sell it below cost, just so that you can get something out of it. <clears throat> and then, uh, the last example, um, in a December report released by the Canadian Pharmacist Association, nearly 90% of pharmacists across the country said shortages have greatly increased in the past year. Antibiotics, anti-nausea, and heart drugs are among the top medications that pharmacists say are in shortage supply. People who can't get access to their primary drug of choice may be forced to go without or take alternatives, which could lead to some serious side effects. Left unabated, the situation could cause someone with depression to commit suicide or lead other patients to experience serious health problems because they couldn't get the drugs they need. Right? So on one hand, you can talk about fashion and you can go, okay, yeah, you know, for that company, that's a bad deal. But when you start to talk about maybe the pharmaceutical supply chain, right, we're in kind of a different... Um, it's a, it's a different beast altogether. So then the question we say, is it all in the forecast, right? Is that what is that what it is? Do we just have to get that right? Okay. Well, again, from 343, what you should remember is forecasts are always wrong, right? They are always wrong. I used to show uh, when the boys were young and we had dark guns in the house, 
they, I would bring a target, and I would have Troy hold the target first, and I'd shoot the target, right? And it was really easy for me to hit the target when Troy was holding it. Then I'd give it to Chelsea, and I'd stand in the same spot, and I'd try to hit the target from here, and it's a lot harder to hit. But that's the way forecasts are. If you're talking about forecasting what's going to happen next week, I can predict that pretty accurately. If I'm going to try to predict what's going to happen next year, right, much farther out, it's a lot harder to predict, okay? Um, and so forecasts depend on what happened in the past and market intelligence, right? And so how much of those you have and how accurate that historical data is when you move forward. So a good forecast has two numbers associated. You have to have a measure of forecast error and standard deviation so that you know the range of your forecast, right? One of the drawings that I do in 343 to show that why we talk about the standard deviation is important, forecast error just says over time how close are you to hitting your forecast, okay? Well, let's say that my, um, my average demand over time is 1,000 units. Now, let me, let me, let me make it bigger. It's 100,000 units, right? But in one month, I sell 50,000 units, and then in the next month, I sell 150,000 units, right? That's a pretty big swing. That's the swing of my average demand, okay? 100,000 units between the two. So over time, if I sell 50,000, 150,000, and I predict 100,000, I'm going to be right on the money because it's going to balance out to the 100,000. So my forecast error is going to tell me I'm hitting it over time. But what it's not telling me is that month to month, I've got this major deviation from month to month, and that's what the standard deviation tells you, is how much are you missing it. So you know, if by chance I was at 900, let's see, 100,000 units, so if I were at 99,000 and 101,000, that's a much better forecast you know, that standard deviation should be very narrow as opposed to the 50,000 to 150,000, okay? Aggregate forecasts tend to be more accurate. It's easy for me to tell you how many total windows I'm going to sell than to tell you exactly what size, what what uh, color, what window tint, right? The, so aggregate forecasts are easier to predict. And then the longer the forecast, the less accurate the forecast. <clears throat> so there's some examples, and I've picked and... In, in, uh, chosen from the slides, and so we might have a couple of gaps that we're just kind of kind of gloss over as we go through them, because I went ahead and, I think this chapter had 60-some slides, and I went ahead and pulled out anything that was actually a problem, and we're just going to talk about it conceptually. <clears throat> so when we talk about safety inventory, that's the difference between the quantity that we order as opposed to what average lead time demand is spent. If you remember when we talked about that in the last chapter, that's that cushion that comes on the bottom of our forecast or of our ordering that says we're going to keep this much in, in safety stock. So for example, if I know that average lead time demand has been 20 units, but I reorder at 24 units rather than 20, right, then my safety stock, my safety inventory is going to be those four units, <coughs> okay? So safety inventory or I safety is going to be my reorder point minus my lead time demand. And we can utilize statistics to determine the amount of safety inventory needed in order to meet a specific service level. And to me, I don't know that I had a really good grasp of this, but I think my life in supply chain would have been a lot easier if I'd have had a better grasp of this when I was uh, in that industry, okay? Um, and so when we talk about that, <clears throat> we're just saying, well, I'm gonna, I'll hold off until we get to the normal distribution curve. We've got some slides on that. So if we agree that forecasts are usually wrong, then actual requirements will fall below units resulting in excess inventory, so it's gonna cost us to hold inventory, or actual requirements are gonna exceed, meaning that we're gonna have lost sales, and that, that can relate to costs of loss of goodwill, okay? Um, options for dealing with stockouts, you can backlog, right? So when customers are willing to wait and have their needs satisfied, but if you think about that, if you use a certain brand of shampoo and you go to Walmart and they don't have it and you need it, are you going to wait for Walmart to restock it or go over to Kroger and buy it at Kroger, right? Most of us are going to walk over to Kroger and buy it at Kroger or buy some substitute if that's what our choices are, right? So backlogging works like if it's maybe a larger appliance, right, or something that you're, you're willing to wait for. Um, but if that's not the case, then your kind of your choice to deal with it is to keep that safety inventory. Okay. So again, we always come back to those two fundamental inventory questions: how much should I order, and when should I order? So how much I should order is dependent on 
that trade-off between the fixed cost of ordering and the holding costs, right? And so our economic order quantity formula that we developed last chapter, right, tells us in the perfect world this is what we should do. Right? <coughs> and when should I reorder? Again, from the last chapter we talked about it, it's going to be your lead time times your throughput. Okay, so in this chapter we extend this concept by talking about how do we manage for uncertainty and demand and uncertainty and replenishment time. Okay, so here's some interesting things again, <clears throat> and it's it's to me it's that next level for you, and you should be getting to this point where you can start to think about things and break them down into their component parts, right? And so when you talk about inventory, it consists of the inventory that you use in your production, which is your cycle inventory and your safety stock that you're holding back, right, for um, that, uh, for what you would say uh, for, to handle the uncertainty, okay? So again, inventory can be broken down into cycle inventory and safety stock inventory. What we know about cycle inventory is it's the average Q divided by two what we're gonna, of what we order, right? So it's Q divided by two. So I can then change that formula to be my total inventory is equal to my average inventory, my cycle inventory, Q divided by 2, plus my uh, safety inventory. Okay? So to determine the time that is a unit is in inventory, then we can use Little's Law. Okay? And so we can use Little's Law because we know that uh, inventory is equal to input times flow time, and we start to make some of those substitutions. So time then is equal to inventory divided by throughput. So I'm going to take my, my Q divided by 2, plus my safety stock and divide it by R, right? And that's, I can then determine. So there's all these substitutions that you can make if you understand how these relationships work to get to different pieces of information, okay? So <clears throat> again, just, this is conceptual. It's not, we're not doing any problems over it, but I want to make sure that you're starting to think in those terms, okay? All right, so what we try to do then is we try to decide, well, how much safety stock should we carry? Well, we should determine what, what is our customer service level that we're most interested in achieving? That should be what's driving us, right? Strategically, what's important to our customer? And we should make a conscious decision on what that is. Is it 99%? Is it 95%? Is it 80%? But you should make a strategic decision to say, this company intends to serve our customer at this service level, okay? And then once we decide that, then that drives then what safety stock we need to have in order to achieve that. Okay. And so your service level, the SL, is just the probability that your lead time during demand is going to be less than or equal to your reorder point. So it's basically saying that's the pro the service level is the probability that we're going to be able to meet that demand that we're going to see. Okay. And we're going to assume that lead time during demand is normally distributed, right? And our safety inventory, we're then going to use a z-score times the standard deviation of lead time during demand in order to determine what our safety stock should be, okay? In Excel, I'm not going to go over that. We're not actually doing any problems, but you can use norms distribution in Excel to get, um, to calculate that service level. One of the things that I wanted to do, because, again, I feel like when I was in your shoes, I didn't necessarily get this like I needed to. Right? Is what's that relationship between the normal distribution curve and a z-score? Okay. Do do you feel like is that a review that's going to be helpful to you? Do you think, or do you feel like you have a really good handle on that? I'm just curious where you think you're at. I'm in steps right now, <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like I know what it is, but yeah. This is our so quality control class. You're in quality control, Abby. Maybe a review would help. <laughs> Troy. I agree. So, so I think <clears throat> here's what happens when you're in stats class. You're like, yeah, I get that, right? And then you get out of stats class, and six months later, you're like, wait, what was that, right? So again, that that kind of going back and reviewing it, I think it is helpful, right? So what it means is the normal distribution says that the mean is at zero standard deviation. Like, so here I'm at zero. That's the mean, okay? So when I'm at the mean, if I only stock to the average. That means that my service level is going to be 50%. Because 50% of the time, I'm going to be able to meet that demand because it's going to fall on this side of the curve. And 50% of the time, I'm not going to be able to meet that demand, right? That's a pretty major concept, right? And so if you only stock to the average, that means that you're okay with a 50% service level, right? And most of us aren't okay with that, okay? <coughs> um, and so 
Um, in statistics, that standard score or z-score is, is the uh, signed number of standard deviations by which the value of an observation or data point is above the mean value of what is being observed or measured. So the z-score is estimated by the distance between your raw score, whatever you think, how, you know, what's the probability, or what's the, are you saying 85% of the time, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, right? So that's that raw score that we're talking about. Uh, and the popula population mean, and then it's divided by the standard deviation, okay? So what happens then is, um, why that's important is the standard deviation is a measure of variability around the mean, right? Everybody okay with that? And so because it's a measure of variability around the mean, if you're, you know, if we give the example like what we were talking about with 100,000 units and 99,000 units and 101,000 units, right, our standard deviation is going to be relatively narrow around the mean. If we're going 50,000 to 150,000, right, our standard deviation is going to be very wide. And so that's, we have to take that into account in terms of understanding how much we need to stock, right? So that's why the standard deviation is such an important part of, um, of this calculation. <clears throat> okay, so just kind of this chart just shows us that at one standard deviation, right, 84.1% of the, um, I'm trying to think of, of the right wording here. 84.1% of the probable outcomes are going to be to the left of that, right? And when I go to two standard deviations, that means that 97.7% of the probable outcomes are going to be to the left of that, right? And three standard deviations takes me to 99.9%, .9%, right? And so what we're saying then is I can pick what percentage, what customer service level I want. Right? So if I would pick 85%, it's going to be slightly more than one standard deviation right, away from the mean. And so then I'm going to stock slightly more than one standard deviation of safety stock, and that's going to allow me to meet that service level. Okay? And so that's all we're doing when we uh, set up our safety stock, is we're saying, well, what's our, what is our um, service level, and then linking that back to those standard deviations to determine how much we need to stock, okay? So what happens is then we need to raise our reorder point until we reach that uh, customer service level. So in order to do that, we have to know the mean and the standard deviation of demand during lead time, and we can use Excel to do that. And again, we're not going to spend a bunch of time on that. After, I'm not going to have you do any problems on it. We've done some in 343. You've done some probably in Dr. Norris' uh, class. Managers often want to determine the safety inventory and reorder point required for a desired service level. So given a service level, we can identify the z-score associated with it. And we can either do that by looking at you know, those tables in the backs of many textbooks, or we can use norms inventory, uh, SL and XL. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and then we can compute our safety stock by taking that z-score times the standard deviation of lead time during demand. Okay? All right. Here's another concept that I want you to get, all right? And so, um, so the sum of n independent random variables, each with identical standard deviation of demand, has that, okay, so has the standard deviation, the sigma sub r, okay? So um, demand over the lead time has a standard deviation of, the standard deviation of demand times the square root of the lead time. So if I have one day, then it's the standard deviation of demand. If I have two days, it's the standard deviation of demand times the square root of two, right? And that's, so that's how we, we determine that, okay? The concept that I want, to, want you to get is this pooled versus uh, regional, okay? And so what I want you to understand is that, and it's maybe not intuitive, because if I asked you by looking at, if we have these two systems, A and B, and A is decentralized and B is centralized, Okay, which one do you think has more safety stock, A or B? How many think A? Oh. How many think B? How many don't know? <laughs> we have kind of an even split across the class between, okay, so here's what the deal is. You will have more safety stock in A because what happens is you're, you're subdividing your demand out, okay, and so 
if I have maybe four areas of demand, and let's say, let's just call <clears throat> upper left here is area one, and they have 100 units, right, on a given day, and B has 90 units, right, I can average those in here, and that gets me to 95 units. So I'm able to take that pool demand, and it requires less inventory because their fluctuations balance each other out, okay? So that's um, because as you subdivide that demand, they're all experiencing their own puts and takes, and so they all have to carry safety stock to cover that. When you pool that demand, right, when you bring it back together, then you have less variation because of, of that. So I'm not saying, again, these are tools that you need to understand because I'm not saying that it doesn't make sense to have decentralized demand. Sometimes it does. Maybe there's other cost factors that you need to consider. But be aware that that variability, um, you have, you're, you're smoothing out that variability when you group those segregated demands together, okay? <laughs> and so... Um, when we talk about centralization, we can have physical centralization, we can have information centralization, we can have specialization, we can have commonality, and we can have postponement. So let's talk about those a little bit. So centralization reduces safety stocks through pooling and cycle stocks through economies of scale, can offer better services for the same inventory investment or same service with smaller inventory investment. Okay, you can achieve that again through physical centralization specialization, information, specialization. So one of the things like we would do at Pella is we may have our own stock, but it would come from the corporate Pella, and the corporate Pella would deliver every day from Pella, Iowa to Story City, Iowa, from Pella, Iowa to Shenandoah. So the main safety stocks were held at Pella, right? And within the plants themselves, we held much smaller areas of safety stock, okay? So that's that combination of both physical centralization and information. Okay. <clears throat> and your cost savings are proportional to the square root of the number of locations pooled. Okay, so we have periodic review policy. Okay, why review it periodically? So you place orders to begin an inventory position up to a target level or an order up to level, and that's in contrast with that continuous review policy. Right? So again, we've, we're still dealing with kind of those two main systems. In continuous review policy, you're watching it constantly, and you're going to order when it hits a, fi a particular fixed quantity. All we're saying here is, and I'm not, I don't even think I'm going to go into the detail, but what I want you to understand is your calculation of safety stock is different in a fixed period than it is in a fixed order quantity. And what, what's different is how you calculate your standard deviation of lead time during demand. It, of demand during lead time is different, okay? I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. Just know that those are different calculations. If you're ever in that boat, you're going to go look up that information anyway, okay? <clears throat> so what I want you to understand, though, is that the periodic review increases inventory because you have to account for the not only when you hit a certain point, but you have to account for when's the next time we're going to look at that product. And so you add more inventory because you have to accommodate for that extra time. Okay? And so if you're trying to manage that, your key lever there is to try and decrease the review period length. So if you were doing it every Friday, is there a way that you can do it more often than that? Okay. So our levers for reducing safety inventory. Right At the end of every chapter, we have our levers. So maybe we can reduce the demand variability by improving our forecasting. Maybe we can reduce the replenishment lead time. How long does it take to get from the vendor to me? Okay. Maybe I can reduce the review. Instead of reviewing it weekly, maybe I'm going to review it twice a week. Can I reduce the variability in replenishment lead time? Can I pool safety inventory from multiple locations? <coughs> um, can I exploit product substitution? So one of the things that we could do at Pella is if we ran out of a particular unit, like a screw, we had, a bat, we had another screw that we could use. Okay. I'll tell you that's not a great example, though, because screws are such a low-cost item that it doesn't matter that much. Okay? Um, so can you use common components? That's one of the things that we really got to from a design standpoint. You want to try to make sure that, you know, um, like on screws, nuts, and bolts, right? Oftentimes, there, you know, somebody that designs it might pick a particular screw because that might be the best application, but the next screw over is not that much different, and if you're already stocking it, Let's not add more part numbers to the system, 
right? Because the more part numbers you add, the more you're dividing that out. Think of that where we're getting, it's that same concept of where if I can pool all of that variability, right, then uh, better off in terms of being able to manage your parts. And can you postpone product differentiation processing until closer to the point of actual demand? So Dell Computers was a good example of that back when I was uh, first buying my first laptop, right? You would go online and you could pick, and it, to me it felt like I was ordering a custom computer. Well, I wasn't really ordering a custom computer. I was just ordering the co components that I wanted them to mix and match in a particular way, right? But what that does for Dell is they're able to do that like in 12 hours, right? I place my order and they've already got those components made and they just go pick them and put them together and ship them, right? Seemed amazing at the time. But they, they've done the majority of the work ahead of time by getting those components ready to go. So it's just that, that pulling those components together. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So that's it for Chapter 6 and 7. Again, that's just kind of that conceptual review. If you have a project that has inventory in it, those are going to be chapters that you might find informational and places to look for opportunities to improve your project. Okay, and again, I just wanted to frame those up. And then what we're going to do when we hit chapter eight, um, it's a pretty cool spreadsheet, I just have to tell you. Um, and I know, that makes me a geek too, right? But, but we're going to use this spreadsheet and we're going to talk about, um, about, let's, so if you have somebody that, if you have somebody that's in line, and then how long they might have to wait in line and what's the probability that they're going to have to wait in line and what's the average length of time that they're going to have to wait based on if we know two pieces of information, we can figure that out. And um, it's, again, it, it's kind of an interesting approach. So the example that I'll use on that, when the team that did the university bookstore, when they returned textbooks, what they were able to tell the university bookstore is, and which you probably know, is that during the time frame when they're having the books return based on the process as it was then, right, the line would grow uh, to infinity and beyond between the hours of 10.30 and 2 or 10 and 2, right, mm -hmm. because they couldn't process people fast enough and so the line was just going to keep getting longer and longer and longer. And so their options were figure out how to shorten the process add more cash registers, or figure out how to incentivize students to come at different times, okay? And one of the suggestions that the group made, which I thought was innovative, was offer some kind of discount for students to come in earlier, right? Um, so maybe a free t-shirt, maybe, a, you know, some little gadget to get people to come between 8 and 10 in the morning and 2 and 6 in the afternoon or evening to try to redistribute that, that workload. The other thing that I thought was interesting about that that I hadn't thought about until we got to that project was they have a waiting line, but do you, what does their waiting line do when you're trying to check out? Do you know where that, where is it situated at? It's in the front of the, when you return books, it's in the front. Okay. Is it in the front? When you return books, it is. When you check, when you buy books, it's in the back. Okay. And so, so I think one of them was when we, when they were, when they were having people buy books, and so that line goes through the merchandise. Yeah. yeah. And so they want a line there. I mean, because they want people to look at the merchandise and assisting. So there's this balance between we want you there so you can look, right? But we don't want you there so long that you get ticked off and go someplace else. But they have a little bit of a, you know, a market in terms of um, maybe I always felt like I needed to go to the university bookstore when I was your age because we didn't have the Amazon option either. So, and the other thing is I always knew I was getting the right version. I think that's the concern you get when you're not, when you don't go that route. So anyway. That's all for today, which is good. It's 10.30, right? So um, have a good couple of days. We'll come back on Thursday, and we'll start in on Chapter 8. And you should have your projects submitted, and I'm going to try to get those graded before Thursday. So should be good.